Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Orange Coast Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Wendy, and I am the intern minister here, and today I am your worship associate. Yay! I am joined by the Reverend Sean Wilshire, who is our minister, and Jacob Swetland, our director of music ministries. Today, our director of religious education, Karen Magoon Pearson, is on leave for a little bit but she generally works with our children and our youth. And we all welcome you this morning and we wanna recognize the many volunteers that are responsible for putting this service together today. They are listed on here. We respectfully recognize that our church property rests on the Ahitraman and Tongva lands. As Unitarian Universalists, we have many different beliefs but we are all one loving community. We're bound together not by a common set of rules or beliefs, but rather a covenant. And a covenant is a promise. A promise that whatever our beliefs are, we accept one another and encourage each other in spiritual growth. We affirm that all life has inherent value and that all existence is interconnected. We strive for justice and compassion in our deeds and relationships and to creating a welcoming community without regard to the traits that sometimes divide people. So to our rumors today, we invite you to silence your phones. And to our Zoomers today, we invite you to say hello in the chat. I want to extend a special welcome to visitors if you're seeking a spiritual home we hope that you will find it here. We begin our services with a chalice lighting. And this morning, I would like to invite Joel up to light our chalice. So Joel has been a member of this church since somewhere around 2016. He is our VP of Finance, and he is a theater person. He loves theater and music and musicals and brings us music quite frequently here in the service. So thank you, Joel. And join us as we say our unison affirmation together. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek truth and love, and to help one another. This we affirm together. Please rise and body our spirit and let us sing this traditional opening Easter song with some different lyrics.
everyone, and also happy Trans Day of Visibility. I'm delighted actually that these two days fall together on the same day this year, because most trans people go through a dark night of the soul, being broken down and then come into a place of true wholeness, which is what Easter is all about. Well, in the traditional sense though of Easter, for you use, it's kind of a, a paradox, right? Uh, one of my favorite uh, biblical scholars, Marcus Borg, he put it best when he said, Easter never happened, Easter always happens. So we celebrate Easter this morning, not necessarily as a historical truth, though that's up to you, but we celebrate it as a spiritual truth, that we all at one point in our lives die and are reborn once again into a new life. We all experience brokenness and then wholeness. And that is the paradox of Easter. And that is the beauty of Easter. So come join us this morning, whether you're atheist, agnostic, agnostic, Christian or pagan, cis or trans, gay or straight, Easter is for all of us. All of us have a place at the table. Let us celebrate. Good morning, everyone. 
I'm going to start out with a little question today. How many people in here have colored eggs before? Wow, that's amazing. I'm so glad to hear this because we're going to talk about colored eggs today. And um, I know most of us, probably close to all of us, have used those little tiny pills. And then you put in the vinegar, and then you put in the water, and that makes the dye for the eggs. And people have been doing this for thousands of years, but we've been doing that for probably longer than you think. That company has been around for over 100 years. And it's still the PAS company, P-A-I-S, which has most of the market on this. So yeah, that's been going on for 100 years or more. But what has also been happening is humanity has been coloring eggs for, like I said, thousands of years. And they used to use things like flowers and fruits and even leaves held across. So why did we do this as humans? It happened when religions weren't really classified into religions yet. But one of the reasons is because in springtime, there are a lot of eggs. Hens typically kind of take the winter off. It's cold, and they don't produce as many eggs. But then when the sun comes out, and it will eventually, someday it will, um, that's when, uh, that's when the eggs start laying a lot of eggs. And these have been used for gifts and for food and all kinds of things. And so hiding eggs and trading eggs, they've been used for money. But they also represent something else. A lot of cultures have used the yolk of an egg to represent the sun. So that's part of our spring tradition. So as we have colored these eggs over time, I want to make a special mention to the eggs from our Ukrainian neighbors next door, which are really rather amazing. And these are called Paisanki eggs. And their tradition, sometimes they would do these, they would lay the eggs overnight into their dyes to get the right color to start with. And then they would put wax over the top and then dip them again. And I'll tell you what the meanings of these colors are in that tradition. So white represents purity and light and birth. Yellow, the sun, the stars, the moon, warmth. Orange, endurance, strength and ambition. Red for happiness, hope, passion and sun. Blue, the sky, the air, and good health. Green, spring, hope, freshness, and renew. So if this is part of your tradition, that's wonderful. We use ritual practices to mark certain events in our lives and just kind of keep, keep leading us into what the meaning making is for us at this time. So. I made these eggs over here with my with my best friend yesterday. It's something we've been doing for a lot of years. So if you have deviled eggs uh, sometime this week, just know this is an ancient tradition. And I'm glad that there are so many people still doing it because it is part of our shared humanity. And at this time, we will welcome up Elizabeth to light our children's chalice. And we'll sing out our children.
singing the kids down. I love it. So uh, let's see here. So I wanted to let you know that um, some of you may remember that I wasn't here last week when Lee was preaching. I was in Arizona uh, at a minister's conference for Unitarian Universalist ministers. And when we were there, we got invited uh, by the local Mormon church to come to an Easter pageant. Uh, and I didn't realize that this was a huge deal, actually. Uh, it was a huge Mormon temple in Mesa, uh, Arizona. And uh, they have been doing a pageant on the temple grounds since the 1930s. And in fact, it's kind of a pilgrimage. There's like 10,000 people a night. Yeah. And uh, there's 470 cast members. There are live animals. There were donkeys and sheep and lambs. Uh, the lamb tried to nibble at the baby Jesus, but you know, Mary shoved him away. Um, I just want to say it was a huge and amazing production. And it was opening uh, night was interfaith night. And so all the UU ministers, and there were a bunch of other different uh, clergy there too. We, we were uh, invited as special guests and they had this lovely reception for us and then escorted us to front row seats for this big pageant. So <clears throat> here's the thing. Did I mention this was a musical, okay, with song and dance of the life of Jesus? They had real water for the boat and there was a baptism which had real water. There were special effects as you can see and the production quality was absolutely amazing, extremely high. In fact, the music was recorded by the London Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, and uh, so that's, by the way, at the top there, that's Jesus rising with the angels around him, if you didn't uh, know that. Um, <laughs> and right, so I have to tell you that during this entire time as I'm watching this for the 75 minute production, and because it's Mormons, it was exactly 75 minutes. <laughs> Uh, I was highly, highly entertained and mildly horrified <laughs> at all of this. Because on the one hand, right, it's this amazing production, right? Visually, audibly, everything. And, and, and the thing is also is that people were so very sincere in this. There were people crying in the audience. And yet I couldn't help thinking, this is what they've turned Jesus into? A Disney production? With a big finale of Jesus rising above them, which of course actually does not happen in the Bible, just saying. The passion portion of the pageant really wasn't much at all. That's the, you know, the suffering of Jesus. Even the crucifixion was really rather short. A, they, they portrayed Jesus as this very kind, almost ethereal person who always walked very slowly and, you know, he's very gentle and, oh, blessings upon you all. Rise now, everyone, right? Never getting upset, very calm. But the man Jesus, the one who overturned tables, who admonished the powerful, who sat with the sick, the poor, the hated, the outcast, he seemed to be very absent from this story. They did tell the story of the Good Samaritan, but they didn't explain that the Samaritan was the outcast. And that's what he's talking about. So the emphasis of this musical was on the miracles, not on Jesus' vision of a beloved community where everyone is loved, where we love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and our neighbors as ourselves. So I've sat with this event now for about a week and I found myself, as the more I think about it, not just horrified, but I'm starting to get a little bit pissed off. <laughs> and you know, it takes a lot for me to get pissed off. And it's, it's not just the Mormons, and I mean no disrespect to their religion and everything, but to generally to the conservative Christian communities that water down Jesus' message, that want to make Jesus' death more important than his life's work. And I get that mine is a liberal point of view, but what pisses me off is that we've let so many of the conservative Christians take the lead in this, to say what Easter is, what Christianity is. I mean, where's our pageant, right? Where's the one that tells our side of the story? We've let them control the narrative, and I think it's time to take it back. I want to reclaim Easter. Dang it, okay. <laughs> Okay. 
you know, our theological ancestors, the Unitarians and the universal, Universalists, which if you didn't know, by the way, those two denominations merged in 1961. So they were originally two separate denominations. And by the early 20th century, starting in the 19th century, they sort of threw the baby out with the bathwater, in my opinion. And they began to reject any biblical stories, and so rejecting the words and wisdom of Jesus, I think. And who can blame them? I mean, really, okay? So many people felt hurt by a tradition that asked them to leave reason at the door, to shirk science, or told them that who they loved or how they identified was wrong or evil. And so we embraced reason and science, which is a good thing that we did that. But we forget that we're more than just reasonable beings. We are beings that make meaning, who need to make meaning to know who and whose we are. So our theological ancestors gave up all those Christian trappings with the occasional nod to Christmas Eve. And we invented and created our own rituals that had meaning for us, which is wonderful and beautiful, like our flower communion that we usually do in May or June and the water ceremony in the fall. But I want to take the baby back without the bath water. I want to talk about the man Jesus for what it was that he was, right? A wise teacher, a Jewish rabbi, trying to create solidarity, support, and resistance for his people under Roman occupation with love at the center. That's the one I want to hear and learn about. Not the Jesus who hates, but the one who truly loves. The one who speaks truth to power and is not complicit with them. The one who builds up something new and does not tear down new ideas because he still has wisdom for us to offer today. And I'm kind of sick of the Christian right setting the tone and only telling their side of the story. Now, I don't want to make you all like freak out or anything like that. I'm not going to be suddenly talking about Jesus every day or every week or anything like that. But on this important day, I want to start reclaiming our story. And part of this reason is to do this is because we, I think, need to heal this. Now, I didn't grow up Christian, okay? I didn't grow up in any church of any kind. But I still felt that conservative Christian stronghold on the world. And when I walked into my very Christian seminary, which was Catholic, no less, I had a chip on my shoulder the size of Texas. I remember being like, oh, just say one word about women being ministers. Just say one word against the LGBT community. I'm ready. I'm ready for you. <laughs> right? But instead, I found among these Jesuits, who turned out to be the liberal arm of the Catholic Church, and other liberal Christians was a way of understanding the story of Jesus that didn't require leaving my brain at the door, but could embrace the, the beauty and vision of a beloved community of which he spoke. And by the end of my time, my chip was off my shoulder. And I want that healing for all of us. So what about our story as Unitarian and Universalists? And it is our story, though we don't talk about it much. We were originally very Christian. The Unitarians Universalists of the 19th century were Christians by any stretch of the imagination, and many still are, but embrace a pluralistic understanding. Now, you could be sitting next to maybe someone who considers themselves a follower of Jesus. You could be sitting next to an atheist, agnostic, a pagan, a Hindu, all of it, right? So why did they stop, for example? Oh, by the way, it might surprise you to know that the Unitarians and Universalists used to hold communion on a regular basis. Now, they didn't necessarily do it every week. Maybe it was every month or on special holidays. It varied from church to church, but often held on Easter. And why did they stop doing communion? Well, we can kind of blame a rather famous Unitarian known as Ralph Waldo Emerson. So I'll read you a little story about how it changed. So Ralph Waldo Emerson, most of you I'm sure have probably heard about him, he became a philosophical and literary icon, but before that he was a Unitarian minister, as was his father. And he served the second church in Boston between 1829 and 1832, only three years. But in 1831, Emerson became embroiled in a controversy at the second church. As a Unitarian Christian minister, Emerson was expected to regularly conduct a communion service. But Emerson did not find the act of communion personally meaningful. 
because he was interested in a depth of authentic personal experience with the sacred that did not have room for ritual for the sake of ritual, Emerson told his congregation that he would no longer offer the sacrament of communion. Yeah, making changes in churches is often a, a difficult thing. So his decision, it created this uproar in the church, and for many Christian Unitarians, communion was a very central sacrament. His declaration seemed unreasonable to them, and church leaders, they tried to negotiate with him, hoping he would change his mind. They offered a compromise. Uh, since some found it meaningful, they asked if Emerson could maybe offer communion to the attendees, uh, but not maybe partake, partake in it in himself. But Emerson would not budge. Emerson recognized this agreement as an insurmountable difference, and he voluntarily resigned his pulpit after three years in it and went off on the lecture circuit. Uh, and many of you probably know uh, some of the things that he wrote and talked about. He was highly successful in this, uh, and he went on to start what is known as the Transcendentalist Movement. And the Transcendentalists believed that each individual could have their own relationship with the holy, and there, no mediator, like a minister or a priest, was needed to have that relationship with the holy. And for him, he found that, holy, that holiness or that sacredness in nature. But other Unitarian ministers, like Theodore Par Parker, they loved transcendentalism. They, they agreed with him on that. But he believed that their church community should be united and that they should also be together and walk their different paths together. He believed that a church community was still important, even if communion was not. So, I wanna ask you this morning, if you would like to enter into a time of just contemplation and considering Emerson and what he did. <coughs> Excuse me. What do you think? I'm gonna take a couple of deep breaths and maybe soften your eyes a little bit or even close them if you like and just thinking about what it was like back then and what do you think was Emerson right to stop holding communion with his church I even want to invite you that if you grew up in a religious tradition that may be different from Unitarian Universalism, what trauma do you hold in you from that experience? Or was it a good experience? What does communion mean for you? When you're ready, I invite you to join the choir in singing words by Theodore Parker, who was a Unitarian minister who embraced transcendentalism, but believed that community was just as important, and he never left the Unitarian church.
don't know about y'all, but um, taking communion or what the Catholics call Eucharist is kind of a strange thing, right? Jesus said, eat this is in my body, drink this, this is my blood. Really? The Romans thought they were cannibalistic, the early Christians, because of this, which I thought was kind of interesting. But actually, it comes from many actually different traditions in the area um, around that, about taking in the spirit of someone. So to me, I don't believe that Jesus meant that literally, but figuratively. I don't think his disciples did either. Uh, in Luke, he says instead, do this in remembrance of me. That is, remember who I am and what I stood for. My body may be gone, my blood spilled, but I am with you in spirit always. Do this in remembrance of me. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, do this in remembrance of my death, of my rising, or the forgiveness of sins. He says, do this in remembrance of me. This is what I want to reclaim in the ritual of communion on this day. Do this in remembrance of life of Jesus, not his horrible, brutal death. His life, what he stood for, inclusion, compassion, love, hope, resistance, justice. So today, if you're willing, I want to invite you to help me reclaim, if just for today, the ritual of communion to make it our own on this Easter Sunday, to remember the life of Jesus and what he stood for, not Disney Jesus. Now, for many of you who have experienced trauma from religious conservatives, I invite you to this by reclaiming it as a way of healing, not being a victim of the religious right, but a survivor in defiance of those who would use Jesus' name to hate rather than to love. As the wonderful feminist Bell Hooks once said, rarely if ever are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. But as always, this is an invitation only. You do what is comfortable for you. So let us celebrate the vision of Jesus and the beloved community by breaking bread, which is something that we do often together. Uh, <clears throat> we usually just have cake. That's our thing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it uh, was and is a sign of community committed to supporting one another. And this morning, we will share this bread, you see down here, as a sign of the spoken word, as an act of empowerment for and reclaiming a vision that all have a place at the table without regard to class or creed or belief or unbelief. All, everyone, all are welcome, for we are creators of justice and joy as was Jesus. I'd like to invite uh, Judy and Wendy here uh, to help me with this morning. You know, you don't need to be a priest or a minister to bless this bread, for we each of us holy, sacred, and good. And so this morning, I'm inviting you to offer your blessing, to offer communion to your fellow human beings. And know that you don't have to take communion if you don't want to take bread, although I will say we have both vegan and uh, gluten-free bread just saying because you know we are you use um, <laughs> so uh, if you would prefer not to have any bread simply put your hands over your heart like this uh, and you don't have to take any bread if it's offered to you now for those of you on zoom uh, when we start not quite yet Valerie Valerie will allow you to unmute and if you would like to receive or give a blessing please turn on your video so please turn on your video if you would like one uh, you can then offer it to one another. And Valerie will start offering a blessing to someone, and then that person offers a blessing to the next person, and so on, until all those online who would like to be blessed can do so. And for us rumors here, Wendy, Judy, and I, Judy, why don't you come on up here? Um, we're going to start with holding a plate of bread, uh, as I said, with gluten-free and vegan options. We'll offer you a blessing as you mindfully take your communion. Don't feel like you have to rush, okay? We got time. Uh, take the blessing, the kind words, and once you are ready, you then take the plate and turn to the next person in line as they take a piece of bread and then you offer them communion and so on. So we're going to demonstrate. Now, there are three lines for the bread communion. Uh, we're going to have one here, here, and there. Uh, if you need to break, uh, have bread brought to you, just let us know and we'll uh, do that and offer you a blessing. 
Um, and you might say, well, what do I say as a blessing? Uh, well, you can offer whatever blessing that you like, but I've got a few on the screen here for you because I know most people like freeze up with it. Like, what am I gonna say? So you can say, may you always know that you are loved. May you know justice and hope. May you be healed and whole. Whichever you would like to say, or all three if you prefer, or anything that comes to your heart. So we're gonna demonstrate how this is gonna go. So I'm going to then say, may you be healed and whole. She'll take a piece of bread. May you be peaceful and at ease. And then she will then, there you go, <laughs> come to me. May you always know that you are loved. All right, you guys got this? All right. Well, please come forward to receive your communion. And Valerie, if you would like to start online, go for it. I'm going to start by offering a blessing to Craig. And your mom's there too, right? Yes. I would like to say, may rainbows always follow the rain for you. Thank you. All right, I'd like to offer a blessing to Anne Ryan. Anne, may you always know that you are loved. Thank you. I'd like to offer a blessing to Phyllis. May your wise ways always continue to grow and bless those around you. Thank you, Anna. I'd like to offer a blessing to um, Marcia. May you know justice and hope. May you be healed and whole. Marsha, my blessing was for you. Would you like to offer a blessing to someone else? You're muted, Marsha. Yes, I would love to offer a blessing to the whole congregation for all their love and support for each one of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peggy. May oh. you all. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> Just say, may you always have a life that's blessed with beauty and flowers. <laughs> Appropriate. Um, I would like to offer a blessing to Bob and Betty. May you be healed and whole. Thank you, Peggy. I'd like to offer a, uh, a blessing to Mark Erlock. Mark, may you always know that you are loved. Thank you. Um, I would like to offer a uh, a, um, a a blessing to uh, Barbara for a uh, very good health, and that she uh, went through her um, cancer uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Elise, may kindness follow you wherever you go. May you always know that you are loved and may you be healed and whole. May you always be loved and you may heal and whole. Oh, gosh, she's too so cute. She's got her mom now, so we're home for the day. Um, I can't see who hasn't been blessed. Do you mind, Valerie, picking someone? Oh, Sarah Hunter, I don't think, has received a blessing. 
Yeah. Oh, Sarah. Okay, I call on Sarah. Um, I am going to call on uh, Marilyn and uh, give her the blessing of may you have peace in your lifetime. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm going to offer. Well, it back thank you for you taking the step of reclaiming. I'd like to with say, me, may you reclaiming be Easter, and hope. reclaiming the words of Jesus and what he wanted, his vision. I don't feel as a Unitarian Universalist that Jesus has to take over our tradition. We're far more pluralistic that, than that. But I also want to reclaim our roots and say our truth out loud and clear to the world that all, all are welcome. Let us sing. Sing our closing song. Unitarian Universalist congregations are fully self-supporting, meaning that members and friends raise all of the funds for the operating budget, ministries, and programs of the church. We are ever grateful for your gifts of time, treasure, and talent. And OCUUC amplifies that spirit of generosity by send, sharing half of the plate we receive with an organization that shares our values. So before I talk about this group, I just wanted to let you know that last month, Ray Elementary was our shared plate, and we made over $800 for those children and the robotics program at the local school. So well done, everyone. This month, we have a really lovely group called Bragan's Kitchen, and it serves the community in a number of ways. And uh, Peggy, who goes to this church, is there she is. She is making beautiful meals and providing all kinds of things for people in this community. We're partnering them because their motto is rescuing, repurposing, and restoring both foods and lives. So that is who we share our plate with this morning. There are multiple ways in which you can support the church and this organization. You can mail a check, you can go through our website, or use an app called Vanco Mobile. And if you're a roomer, you can use the old-timey basket that's going to be passed around. And the choice is yours, but all the information is on our website should you need it. And as always, thank you so much for your generosity.
Thank you, everyone. At this time, I would like to invite Glenn Highland up to talk about uh, his experience with this church for the pledge drive. For the pledge drive. Hello, my friends. Um, you know, I haven't done public speaking in a while, so I'll just see if I can catch on. In the early 1960s, at the height of another cultural turmoil, the civil rights movement, my family was living in a lily white, very conservative, aerospace, uh, aerospace dominated neighborhood near Los Angeles airport. One day, my family decided that we should go to the, to the Liberal Bastion Unitarian Church in Santa Monica, 18th and Arizona, 30 minutes away. I had no idea of the effect that it was gonna have on my life. This was the five years before I went away to school. And what did I learn? I learned what it meant to be inclusive, accepting, I was taught comparative religions. And much later in my life, I was running businesses all over the world. And I could always start a conversation by asking about their religion. It was all the funny places in the world. And I had studied them. And I could listen. And it, I came to see myself as a liberal. I understood where I fit. And that became a part the foundation of who I am. And as I was laying in bed this morning thinking about this, I realized there was one other thing that happened to me in that. When your generation is called Woodstock, peace and love, and sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you just might need a good moral compass. <laughs> and I think the church helped me with that. And I made it through just fine. I was well educated, I got sent off to life, and fast forward 50 years. A stop in a few other churches, plus a congregational and Episcopal and the Catholic. A successful career, an early retirement, many decades, many decades of playing boats. Lots of time in France and living in France, and finally, a return full time to Newport. As you become, shall we say, more senior, you start to reflect from time to time on the meaning of life. You reflect on your life, asking yourself, has it been a life well lived? And as you search for these answers, you start to think about things that have happened in your life that might be of help. And I knew that coming back to the UU Church again could help. It was, a, it was meant to be, to be open and reflecting on a, mean, on a meaning of life greater than your own. So I came looking, thinking of three criterias about whether or not I was going to come to this church and stay here. One, I wanted good church music. <laughs> I, I am the antithesis of a musical person. <laughs> I'm not musical at all but I love the feeling of voices singing together in a church. It touches my soul. And I wanted a minister who could bring it. <laughs> and I'm pretty much a critic about these things, but I wanted to leave church more often than not pondering a diverse set of questions and perspectives. I needed my mind reopened continually because I had to think about the meaning of life and about tomorrow. Lastly, I wanted a community, a community of friends that was thriving, diverse, and growing. With the help of my very good friend, Nina Smith, Please note, she's not here today. <laughs> so guess who gets to pick on her? I, she, she didn't say that she wasn't coming because I was speaking. She had, <laughs> she had other things. But Nina, 
brought me into the church, became my one of my best friends, and I could talk to her about my concerns. And I was very concerned about the survivability of this church until we all stood up, gave money, and agreed to build a new sanctuary. Do you know what an affirmation it is for our community, our church, and us that we stood up and said we are building a new sanctuary? It is, but it is a beginning. This church must get younger and bigger. The population of young people coming here has to grow two, three, four times in the next decade. And that, that effort starts right now. I can't help the church get any younger. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm going the other way. But the drive, the plan, the willingness to put together what it's going to take to bring young people into our church is really important. It's a process. But what does it start with? It starts with money. And I can help with money. Please think and reflect on the words that we repeat, often with minimal, I suggest, thought, each week in the offertory response. We give from our hearts to show that we care. We can change lives with what we share. Someone in the 50s and 60s at the Unitarian Church in Santa Monica made that decision, and it changed my life. It took me as, from a teenager to a responsible adult because they gave. And we can do it again starting today. Please reflect on your personal situation and your priorities, but not for this week, not for this month, but over the years and the decades. See what you can pledge. The time to shape the future of this church is now, and it starts with this pledge drive today. Join me in giving. We can change the lives and shape the future of our community with what we share. And in the light of another religion or another uh, belief, the light in me salutes the light in you. Namaste. Please join us in singing We Gather Together, a song that puts our intentions into words and expresses our gratitudes for the many gifts that we share. Thank you so much, Glenn. Well, now is that time when we honor the important events and people in our lives, and you're invited, one and all, whether you're a member, friend, visitor, anyone, everyone, right, has a place at the table, you're welcome to participate in this weekly ritual we call Joys and Sorrows. And this is uh, Bertie Reed. She's one of our Pastoral Care Associate team members, and she'll be helping to assist you in lighting. right so basically the idea is if you've held something profound in your heart from the last days weeks or even hours uh, if you'd like something has struck you at your core and you'd like to honor such a profound joy or sorrow you are invited to do so if you're a rumor you're invited to come forward and simply light a candle if you'd like to share your joy or sorrow you can write it on a slip of paper that the ushers have if you didn't get one when you first came in but you'd like to do one now just raise your hand and they'll bring it over to you and uh, if you're a zoomer you can write uh, if you'd like to share it you'd like to write your joy or sorrow you can write it in the chat and then uh, birdie will light a candle for you and once the rumors are done lighting candles i'll read all the joys and sorrows out loud as birdie will light a candle for the zoomers so as music is played, I invite you to silently offer healing or celebration as you feel called and according to your own beliefs. Please come forward and light your candle if you would like.
online. Let's see, Sarah H. says, Happy Easter, everyone. May you enjoy a chocolate Easter bunny today. She says, her joy is kids are coming over for dinner. And uh, Marilyn, uh, she said that it's a joy to be on Zoom and hear and participate in today's beautiful and special service. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have Kathleen M. She is currently up here. She says, I'm currently up here in Big Bear Blizzard. <laughs> she says that she is thankful for the awesomeness of nature in this white Easter. Well, just so you know, Catherine, we have pouring down rain here. <laughs> so we're glad there's wonderful snowpack going on up there. That's a good thing. And Sarah J., our administrator, she lit a candle of joy. She says, uh, my husband and I spent a lovely afternoon in Palm Springs Friday, leaving all the serious stuff back here in Orange County. It was nice to enjoy each other. Excellent. And Peggy says, blessings to the Zoomer who ran out of time during communion to receive. May you be whole. Oh, I'm sorry if you ran out of time. We thought you'd have plenty. And Elise J, she has two joys. She says one for baby number two coming this summer, Elise. And one, she says, also for her four-year-old who has pneumonia, but his fever broke last night and he's back to his energetic self just in time to celebrate Easter. Aww. And Craig P, he says he has a joy for time today to talk with his mom, Kay, about family stories and dye eggs with his niece and nephew. Right on. And let's see here. We've got a number of different things uh, here that people wrote. Oh, could you also light a candle also for, to please hold Karen and Jonathan Magoon Pearson. Uh, Karen is our Director of Religious Education. She and their boys, uh, just hold them in your hearts as their family is going through a rough time right now. Let's see, here in the room, uh, Judy said that she had a, a can she lit a candle of joy for all the wonderful birthday wishes and celebrations that she received this week. Her heart is full. She celebrated her young birthday on Friday, just so y'all know. Let's see here. And Paul, uh, I think I said R. Let's see, he says, uh, he lit a candle of joy. He says, my new bride, Jeannie, we began our new life on March 26, 2024. We are both 79 and are 17 again. <laughs> awesome. I love that. And Mifanwi, Mifanwi K, who, yay, had a rough week, but she's back here with us, yay. <laughs> she lit a candle of gratitude for the lovely card regarding her brother who passed away, who said it lifted my spirits tremendously. So there's opportunities for people to sign cards here if you would like. And Allie Kay, uh, she lit both a candle of joy and of sorrow. She says, in joyful celebration of my daughter's wedding to Marike, my new daughter-in-law, and her recent diagnosis, unfortunately, of rheumatoid arthritis. Hmm. Sorry to hear that. And Karen S., uh, our former, the former minister of this church for 13 years, or Minister Emerita, she lit both a candle of also of joy and sorrow. She said she's got pain in her knee, that's the sorrow, but uh, concerns, acceptance, and help from those around me is the joy. And Brianna M. lit a candle of joy and intrigue. She said, if there are four purposes behind all human behavior, she says, if there are four purposes behind all human behavior to escape, to find, to stimulate, and to gain recognition, I can live a conscious life. Okay, that's awesome. Let's see here. All right. And uh, Fatana, I, she lit a candle of joy and of hope. She says, one for her mom returning home, 
from Colorado safely after um, visiting her daughter, that uh, Tan, her sister, who was able to uh, see her family in her last days, oh, and hope for Sloan, uh, my daughter, as she navigates the waters of preteen identity and that she celebrates who she is. Amen. All right. Well, let us hold and love all the joys and celebrations and all the hurts and sadness, both spoken and silent. Let our joys remind us to be thankful, our concerns remind us to hope, and our sorrows remind us always to connect with one another. Let these moments remind us that we are not alone. I invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer. It's a poem by E.E. E. Cummings. It's one of my absolute favorites. I thank you, God, for this most amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirit of trees and a blue true dream of sky, we're still dreaming, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I, who have died, am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and of love and wings and of the gay, great, happening, illimitably earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing any, lifted from the know of all nothing, human, merely being, doubt, unimaginable you? Now the ears of my ears awake. Now the eyes of my eyes are opened. Amen. Let us join together as we extinguish our chalice today. We extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are a congregation of people who believe differently, and yet when we gather together, whether we're here in the room or whether we're here in Zoom, we make up one very loving community. We do not need to think alike to love alike. And hold on, and I'll tell you how to get to be a bigger part of our community. Oh, well, we could just do it like that then. Thank you for coming. I did want to mention that coffee today will be inside because we have a very rainy spring day happening. And so that will be where we meet up for, um, for coffee today. And if you'd like to learn more about us, you can join us at hello at ocuuc.org. Subscribe to our weekly email at the blast at ocuu.org. And we also have programs for children and youth, and we invite you to join us to learn more about our church. So another thing I will say is that we had planned on having our tour today of the campus, but again, it's a little wet out there. So if you come back again, we do offer a tour of our entire religious campus, and we would love to see you there. But with that said, uh, we'll move forward to announcements. All right, so uh, I want to invite you. So as she said, like we coffee is obviously not happening in our courtyard, uh, but if you there's a door right to the left as you come out here, if you want to go out this door, you can avoid the rain and you can uh, actually go into it. We've got a number of really cool things. Not only is there coffee and chocolate, buy the coffee, I'm just saying. <laughs> There's chocolate up there. Uh, but today is also, we've got this wonderful programming committee fair going on. This is a way if you want to learn about what's going on. And Zoomers, there's going to be actually also a window for you to see all the different stuff that's going on in the church and different ways that you can get involved. It should be a lot of fun. It's all brightly uh, colored up and everything like that. So it's going to be a wonderful thing. For those of you who knew Pat McCulley or if you would like to learn about her, you are welcome to come to her uh, Celebration of Life service, which is this Saturday uh, at 1 p.m. here. Uh, 
the other thing I want to mention, we've got two things. One is we, you know, we're right in the middle of our pledge drive, right? And so our church year goes from July to June. So we've got to build a budget, right? So that's why we're doing the pledge drive now. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that happens in June in our annual meeting is we elect new officers to the board into various places. And I know that the nominating committee is hard at work uh, thinking about who would make good leaders in this congregation. And I want to invite you that if you are asked very nicely to say yes. <laughs> Just want to put that out there for you. We all do things, and I want to say we've got a wonderful board. It's, it's a joy to be a part of this community and being on that board. And then I do believe we have a raffle because as soon as you pledge, you get your name in here, okay? And you get, I think it was a $50 gift certificate? Yes. yes. So the sooner you pledge, the sooner you get your name in there and the more times and opportunities you have to get uh, the uh, card. So would you like me to do it? Or would you so like to? in the spirit of Dan's wonderful testimonial, we ask Reverend Sarah Thomas <laughs> to pick the winner today. Woohoo! hoo all right. Da -da 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 -da. Remember one year I won, that was not bad. <laughs> Let's see here. All right. Hey, Bob and Betty Hogan. You're on Zoom. Congratulations. We'll be sending that to you right on. Longtime members who unfortunately aren't able to make it here, but they come every single Sunday on Zoom, and we're so grateful for them. They're just wonderful, wonderful people. So, all right. Uh, let's see here. I think. That's, you can see all the other wonderful things that are going on here. So uh, before we just sing our sing, I want to say to you something I saw. Yes. So Pia summarized, I think, this service very well. And I want to end on these words by her. She said, may you know that you are worthy of love just by being you. Amen. Let us sing our going out song. Let our service continue.